I work at the Open Knowledge Foundation, uh, specifically at Hagdenstadt, which is the FOI uh, specialized um, project within the Open Knowledge Foundation. We run the site Hagdenstadt.de, which is a sister site of uh, the Eleven Heli ones. Um, and we just to give you a bit of an idea of the kind of team we are, which might be relevant for what we're going to talk um, in terms of campaigning. Um, we're a team at the moment of uh, around 20 people, which is quite recent. <laughs> like it, we're, we're at record at how big we are. Um, but we um, are a multidisciplinary team, which means uh, we are campaigners, we are lawyers, we're uh, techies, um, we're researchers as well. Um, so, uh, and we have a team also of investigative journalists and we all work with each other and all of these profiles fit into what we do in terms of campaigning um, and sort of the approaches that we have uh, to collaboration with other organizations and how we campaign around FOI and for FOI. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen for a presentation. Um, yes, here we are. Hope everyone can see it, but we did test it before, so it should be okay. Um, and basically what I'm gonna talk about is just quickly, basically some of the main principles or ideas that we have when we approach campaigning at Hechtenstadt and then I thought maybe the most useful thing would be to run through some of the examples of work, projects, collaborations we've had um, where we've used FOI um, in our campaigning and then uh, hopefully that can serve as ideas, as inspiration or um, can just trigger some questions for a discussion later. Uh, but basically the way we approach uh, our campaigning usually is um, seeing freedom of information as an instrument um, that can help uh, advance the work of others, which means the work of other NGOs, the work of other groups, but also just in general, the help advance um, movements and causes uh, that we're keen on. So using freedom of information um, to help advance uh, the movement for the climate or the movement for human rights or anti-corruption and so on. Um, and this perspective basically means that our campaigning work is mostly, um, to the extent that it's possible, collaborative, which means that we always tend to work with a partner that is specialized in the area that we're working on. So a human rights organization, a climate group, um, a litigation group that takes cases around a particular area. And we always tend to partner up with uh, these sort of actors um, for our campaigning work uh, because they're experts basically in how they can use the information, how this information is most useful to them. And we just help them with the knowledge that we have around FOI and around how can this serve whatever work they're doing. Um, this, just to be clear, is what we try and what we do for most of the cases, but it's not always possible. Today I will work, sorry, I will talk mainly about examples um, through collaboration, um, but just to be clear, sometimes it's just not possible to find a partner organization or there's no um, obvious partner that we can find around a certain topic. So sometimes we really do these sort of campaigning projects or campaigns ourselves and then eventually we might find someone to partner with, we might just have to do it alone, it really depends. But this is what we strive for in most cases. And uh, I think actually the most successful work that we've done um, and the most uh, rewarding work that we've done is through collaboration and through cooperation. And so that's really important to us. And in this sense also, uh, we really try um, to enhance versatility um, in the sense of freedom of information is a tool that can serve multiple purposes. And I'm sure many of us do it in our work. You can use it for research, you can use it for campaigning, for litigation, for organizing. Um, and we try to, when we seek collaboration with other actors, we try to utilize it in all of these ways to just show the extent of the versatility that freedom of information can offer. 
Um, so basically what we achieved through this, I mean, a basic part is relationship building with other organizations, but also usually just within a movement, um, capacity building as well, meaning that we don't seek to create dependency on us as freedom of information actors, but usually part of the broader strategy as well is teaching other organizations, other actors to use FOI on themselves and make it theirs there so that we don't have to be the actor that they always have to come to in order to incorporate freedom of information into their work. So by working with us, we also build capacity within other organizations and other, as and other uh, partners so that they can just incorporate this in a natural way into their work from then on and start using it on their own more and more. Um, and then finally, this also means for us uh, movement building, not only within um, other movements, but within a freedom of information as well. Um, and this is just a concept for us that means that um, like there's usually this distinction between campaigning for freedom of information, so to advance freedom of information, and then using campaigning as uh, using freedom of information as a tool for campaigning. Um, and for us, actually, there's not really so much a distinction because when we use FOI as a tool for campaigning, we're also campaigning for freedom of information. We're showcasing the value at its most. <laughs> we're showcasing how useful it is, how fun it is, um, and basically how you can integrate it into your work and it can become a tool at your service. So for us, integrating FOI into other organizations campaigning means campaigning for FOI. So that's also how we see this sort of collaboration as movement building for freedom of information as well. Um, so I'll go just through some examples um, very briefly, because um, I also tend to speak a lot and I lose track of time, but I'll try to be brief. Um, maybe Jen, you can like wave at me like this if I just go on too long. Um, but basically, I'll do this distinction between proactive approach uh, when it comes to building an FOI-based campaign and then a reactive approach. By proactive approach, what I just mean is that when we uh, enter into contact with an organization or a group, um, we build the FOI element in their work by design. Um, so it's there from the very beginning. Um, and examples could be, for instance, uh, a request campaign uh, where we provide infrastructure, where we have pre-written FOI requests that can be filed with just one click. Um, and we've had a lot of collaborations uh, with different organizations from a lot of different sort of civil society movements um, throughout the years. This one, for instance, um, happened with Foodwatch, which is an organization that works around food quality and uh, also consumer rights regarding with food and access to food. Um, and they were very interested in the food reports of restaurants in all of Germany. So these are health reports. Health authorities go to a restaurant, they evaluate the health conditions um, and they create a report. So these are requestable documents. So we collaborated with them um, so that they could get their base, which is composed of tens of thousands of people to file requests um, just for any sort of food report from the restaurant that you usually eat at, uh, from something in your neighborhood, a new restaurant, something like this. Um, and that resulted in thousands of documents being released around this um, and Foodwatch sort of incorporating this technique to involve their base um, and also, of course, to just have a database of food reports that are now available and very useful if you just want to pick a restaurant um, in your area to have lunch any day. Um, a different type of format of cooperation can be litigation, of course. Um, we are currently in a lawsuit with um, the sea rescue organization Sea-Watch, um, and they we've been working together for quite a long time. and. A lot of the work that they do is, of course, advocacy and campaigning around safe passage in the central Mediterranean and trying to understand a bit what is preventing all of this. 
Um, so we collaborated with them on a freedom of information lawsuit to gain more uh, transparency around the situation in the central Mediterranean. So this lawsuit, it's ongoing. Um, Sea-Watch filed it, we're a corporation partner. And that's a way also in which Sea-Watch is incorporating freedom of information little by little in their work. Um, and a lawsuit is also a great uh, campaigning tool, of course. So it helps also um, for them to emphasize how transparency is actually preventing compliance with human rights um, when it comes to migration and border control in the EU. Um, other types of corporations, journalistic work as well. Um, we have ongoing corporations with a TV show in Germany, which is a political satire. I don't know if people are familiar with John Oliver in the US, um, but it's it's the German John Oliver, so it's that sort of comedy, but politics as well. It has a couple, a good couple million viewers in Germany, um, and we always cooperate with them where we built investigations using freedom of information, um, and then they make a show out of it. Um, and then usually they will publish a website where all of the documents are made available, and then all of their viewers come investigate these documents. We've had campaigning uh, stem from these documents being made public um, in some of our collaborations. So it's usually a very useful way for us um, to showcase the value of FOI and then make public to a very large audience um, a lot of documents that, that can be useful from then on. Um, another possible use for this is advocacy. Of course, um, there are many organizations doing advocacy at the EU level that struggle with transparency. One of the corporations that we've had quite recently um, is around, again, uh, border um, human rights compliance and Human Rights Watch and Border Forensics who were looking at how the European Border and Coast Guard works with the Libyan Coast Guard to prevent boats from arriving uh, to the EU. Um, and a big question for them was whether they could obtain actually the information they need for their monitoring, which is a big part of what Human Rights Watch does. Um, so we collaborated with them to file a lot of FOI requests. And this is a good example also because, of course, a lot of the information they were interested in was not released uh, because it is quite sensitive. Um, but actually, this served for them to make the point that actually transparency is part of, first of all, their demands, but also one of the obstacles that um, we currently have to um, be able to monitor whether human rights are being complied with or not. So I like this example as well, just because it goes to show that you don't always need disclosure in order to have a good corporation and a good campaign, but actually prevention of disclosure um, is quite useful as well as a campaigning tool. Um, and these two organizations have used all of these redacted documents um, quite a lot to showcase what is the obstacle here and how lack of transparency is actually preventing their work. Um, and then, oh, sorry, um, just a couple of examples of what the reactive approach would be, which is instead of building the FOI element by design, um, it would rather be uh, the um, sort of the opposite. So we, obtain or we fail to obtain um, some documents just through our own investigations requests. And then we think, okay, so who could benefit from these documents or who could we partner up um, to make the most of this refusal? And then we go to someone um, or yeah, it happens in a more, uh, in a less structured way, let's say. Um, but that can be uh, quite successful as well. So. Um, another idea of how we've incorporated FOI into a campaign. Um, there's, I mean, they're all around Europe. You will have these petition sites. Uh, this is Campact, which is in Germany, but there's usually one for each member states and actually they're all coordinated between them. So if you're working on any European issue, it could be the case that you can establish a corporation with one of them, and then this becomes relevant for all of the national um, campaign sites as well. So here we were doing a campaign around Frontex and how different member states contribute resources to Frontex 
Um, and of course, this is relevant to all member states. So we're working with um, all of the different national sites and we're using FOI also to map different negotiation stages within these contributions so that uh, they can actually launch the petition coordinated with the negotiation moments to have a greater impact. So that's a way in which we're incorporating the tool. Um, again, litigation is a good reactive way as well. Um, in this case, uh, it's a communication, so a case before the International Criminal Court around the EU's role in um, border policies. And uh, we had this big, big database of documents um, that we've obtained throughout the years. And of course, everything we obtain, we make public. Um, and we just got, into, uh, got in touch with the ECCHR, which is a litigation organization um, doing litigation for human rights. And we knew they were working on an ECC, ICT case um, and they were looking for some evidence. So we worked together with them to identify some relevant documents that could help their pleas um, in the ICC case. So that's also um, sort of a way in which this has helped um, this important case. Um, and then finally, the last example I wanted to give is around movement building and organizing. Um, and this is also, I think, a very nice way into which maybe we just incorporate a, a bit less. But in this case, for instance, um, we like our work around FOI and all of the research that we publish in the documents um, were useful and we ended up incorporating quite a bit into, for instance, um, a referendum that uh, was organized in Switzerland for the first time um, around Switzerland's involvement within Frontex. Um, so it was quite a groundbreaking experience and a lot of our research and documents um, served form up the information campaign and the campaigning and the organizing um, sort of communication strategy around this um, referendum. So that's also maybe a different collaboration um, that we can seek. Um, and just to quickly end on just some lessons learned um, that we've come so far, just because also this is always sort of work in progress and we keep testing approaches and we keep learning also from our own experiences. So this is what we've learned for the time being. Um, again, the importance of versatility, there's many, many ways in which FOI can serve a movement. And if we think of the composition of the movement, it's just very broad and very diverse. You have, again, academia, journalists, grassroots organizations, established organizations. And I think for us, what's been really key in integrating freedom of information within a movement is uh, just being able to be versatile and being able to work with all of the different components of a cause and a movement. Um, and this has meant that FOI at the end of the day becomes a visible campaigning tool just because you're kind of everywhere in a way um, and you're serving many, many aspects. Um, in that sense, I think it's important also to highlight that uh, in our understanding of campaigning, FOI doesn't always have to be the most visible side of the campaign. Um, sometimes it will be, for instance, if you take a lawsuit around FOI, uh, so you litigate for access to information, um, that will make FOI the center of the campaign but sometimes it's not. And it's just a, a little element within a campaign or a little element within a piece of research. And that's okay too, actually. And that is part of the versatility. And I think for us, what's important rather th than to have um, FOI at the center of every single collaboration, it's more about making multiple and different and constant contributions to different actors and about just being there and building it up little by little. And sometimes, FOI will shine as a solo actor and sometimes it will not. And that's still valuable. Um, and then, yes, about this reactive, proactive approach, just to say that it also means that sometimes the question when you have documents um, or you have a freedom of information request 
the question is how uh, or whose work can this serve? And sometimes it's about approaching actors proactively um, or letting people approach you and asking the question, how can we advance your work? But it's putting um, the instrumental nature of the right first and thinking of how can this help whoever is approaching you um, and just saying that, I mean, I don't think this is a absolute requisite, um, but I do think that at least in our experience, uh, building a profile around a certain topic or just working within a certain topic has been quite useful to, uh, yeah, to come across more collaborations and more diverse collaborations. Again, I don't think this is a prerequisite, but for instance, we do work a lot around certain specific topics that are important to us as an organization and as a team. I work a lot around climate justice, around migration, around far-right extremism, uh, around surveillance, around topics that we just care about a lot. Um, and the more you operate in these areas, the more your work is known, the more people will see that you've worked with this organization and they will call you up, uh, the more contacts you can make so that you can approach these people and say, how can our work serve you as well? Um, so it's just been very useful for us in this regard. Um, and it also means that you get to work with more people and it makes the movement stronger, which is at the end of the day, what we want. Um, because us alone, we cannot hold a right. <laughs> so we need more people around us that use freedom of information, that care about it, and that are ready to defend it. So that's it from my side. Thank you so much, Luisa. That was super interesting and has given us a lot of food for thought. I know some people already have questions. If you can hold them until after Jubo's presented, then we will do a question and answer session all together. Um, Jubo, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Luan, and thank you, Luisa, for amazing presentation and nice inspirations. I hope you can see my screen. Okay. Uh, so everyone, hello, my name is Jubo. Uh, I am project lead for civic tech and community building at Forset which is a CSO based in Tbilisi, Georgia. We specialize in data communications and data storytelling. We also run a SCOG platform on Alavetelli's infrastructure. And I'm really happy to contribute to this community today by showing you methods that we used for bringing all this open data to real life and causing positive social impact with uh, really, really small resources. So if you also run a platform on a lot of this infrastructure, chances are high that we started just like you. Uh, we knew after working in the field for six years that civic tech platforms uh, are not as easy to build as it looks when you scroll it mm -hmm. and it's really complicated and we should never build it from a scratch. So we discovered a Lovatelli platform. It was waiting for us to translate and localize it to a Georgian language, and we did it. Uh, as for to today, this is results that we have on the platform. Mm, over 2,700 requests, uh, 21,000 visitors, more than 700 community members, and 137 data stories and investigations created using data from the portal. Uh, we consider this number success because Georgian population is relatively small and also Georgian democracy is fragile with low culture of civic participation. So how did we come to this? We came to this uh, success by crowdsourcing in data visualizations, or you can also call it data storytelling. Uh, of course, the first thing that we wanted when we uh, started doing uh, this platform, as called your platform, was people to actually send uh, requests using the platform uh, and make platform sustainable. 
But the question was, would that be enough to cause impact? Having all this data on the platform, is it enough to put so much effort? Uh, probably no, because even before the, the project, we kept hearing from open data communities that um, sometimes or most of the times open data is not really used much and it, uh, it just stays on platforms and on different databases. So we thought, what is a better way to bring all this data to real life than using data storytelling and data journalism? Because those fields cannot exist without data, so we can give them data. And also those fields, um, people who do this are the ones who reach wide audience with their data stories, articles, and visualizations. So that's how we started organizing data visualization competitions. Um, in total, we organized 10 competition and the whole point of our competitions is that participants need to use data from ASCOG platform and make compelling visualizations. Um, if they request uh, information using the platform, they receive bonus points, which means that we are boosting people to use ASCOG. Or they can, it, it might be that they don't want to request information, but they can use data from a Scoji platform and make visualization. Of course, in our competitions, participants can use other data, secondary data from other sources as well. We actually encourage them to do it, but the primary data should come from the Ascoji platform. So 10 competitions in total, our target audience uh, are usually students, designers, data activists, developers, so basically everyone who is uh, passionate about open data and data activism. In total for these 10 competitions, we had 7,000 euros as a prize pool. Uh, in total, we had more than 500 participants, 25 winners, 25 published stories and data investigations in media and 137 data stories created. So basically what we did is that we collected hundreds of freedom of information requests by competitions on our platform and also brought this data to real life. Um, so we put uh, two balls in the basket at the same time, if that makes sense in English language. Mm, let me show you some of the examples, some of the stories that were developed in the competition, in our competitions. So in this example, uh, one of our participants requested and receives data showing that government is giving uh, land uh, for free to Georgian church. We are talking about half a million uh, square meters, a huge numbers. And he received this pretty boring numbers, which probably does not make sense until uh, he visualized these numbers uh, with this. He created a really simple interactive website uh, showing all this data with beautiful uh, diagrams and infographics. So if person saw all this data without these visualizations, most likely it would hurt uh, person's eyes, but these visualizations were compelling it sparked a massive public discourse and political discourse. People started discussing what the hell is going on? Why are they giving our land for free uh, to the church? So it was success story for us. It is the same. Okay, so what, what happened in this story is that participants discovered data on the portal showing that Georgian Ministry of Internal Affairs is, usually, is using Russian AI systems to investigate crime and collect personal data such as fingerprints, um, such as face recognition systems, and uh, these uh, systems were connected to Kremlin. So, of course, uh, what the participant did is that uh, she developed data story using this portal with multimedia article, which looked something like this. 
Uh, it also sparked massive uh, political discourse. It was not the most peaceful week for us because political parties we are having briefings. There were uh, reports on TV channels, cybersecurity experts talking about this and discussing this. And unfortunately, by the end of the week, uh, ministry said that this story that we published uh, was fake. It was ordered and paid by someone, uh, which was said because according to their logic, we just published information that they sent to us. So according to their logic, they spread fake news. But well, uh, this is how it's ended. And yes, uh, people are still discussing this and we did something really important. This is another example on vaccination of homeless animals and impact it can have in Georgia. This is another example on climate change and how it affects Georgia and our personal lives. Yeah. Uh, after a while, uh, once we collected enough data on the platform and made the portal sustainable, we decided to split competitions into four different directions. The first is student competitions for bringing newbies and new people into data activism. And in those competitions, requirements are really low. So you can develop any type of visualizations. They just need to use our data and send freedom of information requests. There's also general competitions in order to keep our general community active and engaged. We also developed fellowship programs for high-level journalists who produce high quality investigative articles using data from Ascogi, publish these articles on their uh, media outlet platforms and reach wide audience. And we also started merging data from Ascogi into uh, some different hackathons organized uh, by Forset. We also added community gathering uh, active, uh, component to our activities because this data visualization competitions helped us a lot to build community of open data passionates in Tbilisi in our city. So how to do it in a nutshell, uh, how to organize data visualization competitions. Uh, this is our uh, streamlined process that we follow every time we plan a new competition. In the first week, we define format and ask ourselves, should participants request information from the platform or maybe not. It really depends on the requirements that we have uh, for competition. Also, you should ask yourself what type of visualizations participants should develop, such as infographics, quizzes, multimedia articles, animations. We usually give participants free choice to select whatever format they want to develop. Uh, second stage in the same week usually is to design concept note. Define your target audience, what will be thematic challenge for your competition. Sometimes we organize competition around equality issues, sometimes about environment, transparency, etc. Uh, we also define what is the prize pool, if we have any, who will be mentors, who will be in the jury to assess visualizations, and what will be assessment criteria to determine winners. I will be happy to send you all the templates about assessment criteria if you are interested in it and you can adapt it to your needs. In the second week, uh, we de develop outreach materials. We create visual identity, which looks something like this that we use for social media outreach. Here you can uh, see how Ascogi helped us to partner with so many uh, different organizations. Uh, yeah, so we also develop a blog which describes format of the competition in detail so that people before they register can read this format. I will also send this to you if you are interested. And we also develop social media outreach messages and also registration form. Uh, in the second week, we also develop resources for competition participants, which can include good examples of data visualizations, tools that they can use to create data visualizations, uh, lists of online workshops. This looks like this. I can also send this to you. It includes 
good examples of visualizations, workshops in English language about data analysis, visualization, design, copywriting, and some user-friendly tools for data visualization. And what happens after that is that we start outreach to recruit as many participants as possible. It can include one-to-one -one approach. It can include social media posts, sharing this post to different groups, sending newsletters to your communities, press releases to media outlets, invitations to universities. Uh, and once you have newly registered participants, it's good to send them these resources that I just showed you so that they don't lose time and they watch workshops and get known with visualization tools. If it's possible, if you have uh, resources for it, you can provide mentorship to competition participants, uh, mentorship in data analysis, design, copywriting, or just give them general advices. And uh, in probably 10th week, you might help present, you will have presentations where participants present their visualizations briefly for five or 10 minutes and the jury determines winners. Competitions do not uh, end here because there's also incubation period. Uh, in the next maybe two or three weeks, participants receive, winners receive feedback from the jury, from mentors, so that they make their visualizations perfect because before it gets published in, in online media and social media. Competitions will help you a lot to transfer data from a portal to real life with multimedia stories, articles, quizzes, animations. It can also help you nudge citizens to use your portal and eventually they will start using your portal without data visualization competitions. And it will also help you build community of open data passionates. You really don't have to be expert in data visualization to make this happen because there are tons of organizations and people. You can partner with them if, you, if they have expertise in, let's say, design or visualization. Or if you don't want to do it, then you can organize competition in other formats, such as analytical articles competition based on data from your portal. If you don't have resources for the prize pool, uh, you can consider offering participants different things such as internships at your partner organization, at your organization, certificates, students love it, tickets to different cool events and many more things. It really is not a single person or two person job. A whole team from Forsat invested in this. Uh, especially when we started doing it without having uh, much knowledge about competitions. As you can see, our team includes researchers, illustrators, designers, um, data journalists. So sometimes it was pro bono work for us, but then it really helped us land new resources and support from different donors to do these competitions. And those who decided to receive mentorship uh, from us to implement competitions, it will not be just me, but also these people who will give you advices to implement your project in different stages. That was all. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Chivo. That was super, super interesting as well. Um, so we now have about 15 minutes um to do questions and answers um so i think the best way to do this is if anyone's got a question if you can raise your hand can we raise our hands here sorry again hang on a second i'm used to using google meet so i did not think about raising hands um but if you can ping me in the chat um just let us know that you want to speak so that we're not all trying to speak at once um, and then, yeah, go ahead. We've got 15 minutes. So until 11 o'clock, um, we'll do a quick Q&A and then we will have a quick uh, session one, two, four, all after that. Just to confirm, I'm just going to stop the recording. Is that? Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay, I can see Helen has a question. So Helen, once the recording...